Good morning again. There we go. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Williams. It's good to see y'all here in this cold morning. Let's warm this place up with a smile. Find someone to smile at this morning. Go. All right. I hope everyone has their bulletins open and ready. There's a lot of announcements that I need to tell you about. But first, know that if you're visiting, you get to do something fun this morning. Look at the end of your pew, and hopefully there's a little slim sheet of paper you can fill out so we can have a record of your visit. Um, but first, we're going to have Rhonda come on up here, and she has an announcement to make about children. I am short, yes. Um, good morning. I just wanted to... Um, kind of give you a heads up we're uh, meeting with the children's committee and we got to talking about how um, some people may not realize what classes and what we have going on so we wanted to make sure we um, kind of let you know where we are and what our needs are um, in this within this process and what's happening um, we do have preschool and um, age uh, preschool age Sunday school every morning and that is usually taught by Courtney Johnston and um, so Summer Quinn and um, Jessica Medley. We, they swap out each month. And then we have, um, once they graduate from preschool and get into kindergarten, kindergarten through second grade is with Christy Shu. And we would like to find, and this is where I would like to prayerfully consider where you might could serve if you felt like you would like to do that. Um, Christy's been doing this for a, for a while with those, those kids, and, and sometimes we realize, and I know like we've had several, I know Nancy was mine, and several of them have since retired, and um, it gets, you do get to where you want to be in a Sunday school class of your own. So we would like to find somebody that might would rotate with Christy um, on a month basis, um, monthly like that and so I'd like for you to kind of think about that and who might would do that. that that's the kindergarten through second um, third and fourth is Cheryl and Cheryl is at a point in her life where she she would like to retire <laughs> retire from she's been doing it I mean she had lots of us like Nancy and um, many others did and we would like to I know she's not here this morning so this is a good time to <laughs> kind of say this um, we would like to do something special um, when she is here and kind of, you know, recognize her for the years of service that she has done, but also um, find someone, because we will have some moving up, find someone that might would be willing to take that slot um, for those third and fourth graders. At this time, Leanne um, Hamby and Stacy Porter do our fifth and sixth graders, and right now with our groups, um, we have several that are in the fourth grade that are about to move up to fifth and sixth, so right now we're going to, we're moving them in with Leanne and Stacy um, in that fifth and sixth grade, so it'll be kind of third, fourth, fifth, and sixth at this moment. So that's kind of our children. Of course, then once they get into sixth grade, they start working with the youth a little bit, and they're going to be moving up. Um, I just want to let you know that's 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 what we do, and we do have those. We have people that do Wednesday night with our children. Um, I'm I do Wednesday night, but right uh, right now, Chrissy Shu, myself, Courtney. Lauren, they're so, and then Jake and Courtney have been helping us where we rotate on Wednesday nights because whether you realize it or not, lots of those, if you think about the ones that are there, lots of us teach. And yes, although we have the gift of teaching, we don't want to teach all day long every day. So, and I know um, those that, are, that have done that before, they, you, you know what, I, what I'm talking about. It is nice to be able to come in and, and we want to have places for these children. So we want to make sure you understand that we do have those opportunities and they are there and um, we haven't told you who they are and sometimes I think people get kind of confused about what happens and of course we do have children's church um, every Sunday the only Sunday of the month that we don't have it for the older children is the last Sunday of the month but it is there for our preschool age children every Sunday and we have people that are doing it and they rotate and it's a good process right now um, with that so I just kind of wanted to let you know where we are what our needs are on Sunday nights we have um, a young, well, a young man <laughs> who is volunteering and has been asking for a while, and he's taking over our boys on Sunday night. Brian Boozer has taken over our boys on Sunday nights, and I think that's awesome. Um, we have a good group of boys uh, at that age level that's in, in grade school and then getting ready to move up into the youth age. But um, we do need to find somebody, and Stacy and Jamie do help with them, but they kind of the progression of things is when your kids get old enough and they move into the youth, guess where you move? 
to the youth. And so um, we, we need somebody that might be willing to help take, care, take on the girls or being a rotation to take on the girls um, on Sunday nights. And what we've talked with Chris about is we'd like to kind of on Sunday nights do sort of that um, old RAGA, but something with missions with our kids where they're uh, learning about missions, studying about mission, and maybe even Skyping with missionaries, that kind of thing. So just kind of giving you where we are and what we do. And as you see people come in that are visitors and have children, we do have places for them. And we just want to make sure you knew who we were. And so um, if you have questions about, hey, where do they go, you can see myself, you can see Lauren, Christy Shue, um, Heather, DMC, several of us that work with the, the children's or on the children's committee, that would be, so just kind of let you know some info. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. All right, hopefully those bulletins are open. Um, look with me, tonight we will have our Super Bowl chili and soup cook-off. Um, it will be a fundraiser for our mission trip this summer. It's going to be at this, in the CMC starting at 5 o'clock. We'll watch the game. Make sure that you come hungry. But we're just asking for donations. Um, you'll get tickets um, like we've done in the past to vote for your favorite. But you don't have to come and pay to eat. So just come. You know, just come and eat. Um, there will be a couple of meetings going on today. There's actually two. Uh, the audio and vid visual Committee, you will be meeting in the sanctuary here, 4 o'clock this afternoon. And in the daycare board, you will be meeting in the library at 4.30. Um, there's a meeting tomorrow, if you notice there, cemetery committee meeting. And it, there will be, it will be tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. So this is a meeting for anyone if you've served on this committee in the past, you're serving on it right now, if you want to serve. Anyone can come to this meeting and be a part of it. Um, Wednesday night, we will have supper at 5.30, and then what I'm super excited about is our Ash Wednesday service will start at 6.30, so make sure you come this Wednesday. Um, and also, you notice in your bulletin there is an insert. It's about our annual Valentine banquet. It will be next Sunday night starting at 5 o'clock. Now, you need to get this filled out by Wednesday and make sure that you turn it in to Peggy in the office. Okay, make sure you do that. Um, after the service this morning, if I could just please meet with my youth parents really quickly, that would be great. Okay, and there's other things to read about. Make sure that you look on the back there, some other stuff going on, other meetings as well. Um, all right, I've done plenty of talking. Now it's your turn. Find someone to say good morning to. Kiss them on the cheek, hug their neck, just give them some Williams love. Go. Good morning again. Good to see all of you here this morning as we've gathered together in this place for worship. And as we come together in this time, let us begin our time together with a word of prayer. Great God, we come to you this morning. Lord, as we have gathered with friends, with family, with one-time strangers who are now, Lord, our friends. As we are in this place, as we worship you, God, we pray that as we have come together, the songs we sing, Lord, may be songs we sing for worship, for you. As we offer our tithes, our offerings, our prayers, God, we pray that they are they're good, that you receive them. 
Lord, that as we have come together to hear from your word, we pray, Lord, we have ears to hear what you are having to say to us. So, Lord, now as we've gathered, we, we know that you have joined us in this place. And we pray that your spirit be with us, moving in our presence, stirring our hearts, calling us, Lord, further into the work of your kingdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Our scripture call to worship comes from Exodus 34, um, 29 through 35. <clears throat> Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. If you would take a hymnal this morning and turn to 499, Sunshine of My Soul. Sunshine looks great coming in the wind. Let's just think about the sunshine in our soul this morning. Stand as we sing. Turn back uh, to uh, 307, send the light, and again, let's do the first, second, and fourth stanzas.
Sarah says it. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I have cocoa and Abby's <laughs> The rest of you guys are shy today, aren't you? Do you guys know what this is? A watch. Tape measure? Tape measure. <laughs> it looks it's a little like more... a watch to the... That's so weird. What do you use measuring tape for? Measuring. Measuring things. So I thought what we would do today is we would see if we could use this tape measure and figure out who the biggest Christian in the church is. Think that sounds like fun? Um, who do you guys think the right who do, you think the biggest, <laughs> who do you guys think the biggest Christian is? God. <laughs> Always yeah. I was thinking, and I and I so I asked him. I was thinking maybe Mr. Rex. You think he might be the biggest Christian in the room? And we can figure that out with this. You guys want to try? Uh, yeah. Yes. yes, thank you for saying yes. You're right. All right. So, <laughs> all right, who wants to try to measure? Okay. Uh, uh, can you measure the top of his head with that? Can you measure? Can you reach the top of his head with that? <laughs> Good thinking. There you go. That's going to be hard. <laughs> Makes him the biggest Christian in church. Is that how we usually think, think of how much Christian? Is? No. Can we use a tape measure for something like that? No. What is it that? Yeah, I'm on my dad. <laughs> I want to tell you that. What is it that makes us uh, uh, what we think of as a good Christian? What is it? How do we measure whether we're being a good Christian? Um, you have to make sure that you do the right thing. Make sure you do the right thing. You know, there's an old song that says, uh, I don't know if it's an old song, it seems like an old song, um, that we will, they will know we are Christians by our love. Oh, wait, we sang that. You do, yeah, we, we sing that. Excuse don't we? me. <laughs> <laughs> now, can we use a tape measure to measure how much love we have for people? No. No? No? Well, I thought we could yeah. measure all sorts of things. Can't measure. Yes. Yes, you yes. can. <laughs> so, so, what we have to remember is that we want to use when we're trying to, to be a good Christian and we're trying to think about how to be a good Christian is that it's not how big we are, how tall we are, how strong we are, how smart we are. What is it? It's how much we... Love. It's how much we love each other. Just like that. So that's, that's what I want you guys to remember is that it's, it's all about if we... It's how much we love people that is what really matters, not what shape or how tall or, or any of that stuff. Okay. All right. Well, you guys go to children's church and enjoy yourselves. And it's for all of us. It's what? For all of you. Yes, for all of you. Yes, you go to children's church now. <laughs> Offertory hymn this morning is 408, Have Faith in God. And we'll do only the first and last stanzas, first and last stanzas only. Please stand as we sing.
Lord, we realize that we live in a in a land of plenty, Lord. And just uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to to live here. And Lord, uh, none of us know how it is to be hungry, Lord. Just uh, thank you for that. And just Lord, pray today that as we come and, and give our offerings, that we would uh, remember, Lord, to uh, realize that our uh, the most important thing is you, Lord, and not the things that we have. Just help us to realize that all things are yours, Lord, and just have thankful hearts for what we have and give us uh, giving hearts to give to your work. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Lord be with you. The watch on my battery died this morning, but Jeannie has said she will make sure I know what time it is. So um, well, I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the ninth chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through the first half of 43. Luke chapter 9, we'll begin on this Transfiguration Sunday with verse 28, and read through verse 43 there. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation." How much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? God, our Father, Christ the Son, our Holy Spirit, at this time may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing unto you, and may we hear your words, and not whatever words I may put in the way, and may they transfigure us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, two summers ago, 17 of us boarded a plane heading for the city of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Some of you, or most of them, some of you were in this room who went with us. And I still remember what it felt like when we got off that plane. The musty smell of the airport that felt more like an abandoned Greyhound station. The people that were rushing past us, the people stopping who wanted to help us with our bags, as we later found out, they wanted to help but for a fee. And then there was the sudden realization that for just a short plane ride, we were now in another country, that we were the foreigners. I can still see in my mind that ocean of people When the doors of the airport opened, it it was this seemingly endless pool of people all crowded together, hoping to earn a few dollars from those making their way from the airport to the parking lot. And then there was the ride to the school where we were staying in the back of the blue truck. And I don't think Amy is here this morning, but I still see Amy, the only one who could stand up and not hit her head in the back of the truck, holding all of our bags back like this human cargo net and thinking, man, she's a lot stronger than I thought she was. 
We drove over the rough roads of that beaten country, passing people burning palm trees on the side of the road to make charcoal, women carrying naked babies and pieces of fruit in their hands, men sitting cross-legged, selling stuff that most of us would consider garbage. And then there was the smell. Someone commented it smelled like a combination of zatarans and sewage. But really, it was a combination of compost, smoke, and yeah, human waste. We stayed in a school building made out of concrete right in the center of the city, surrounded by half-crumbling buildings, tents, and lean-tos. And in the week we were there, we witnessed some pretty heartbreaking things. Malnourished babies, sick children, discouraged families living in groups together in an abandoned building. But we also witnessed some pretty wonderful things. We stayed, after all, at a school, and at that school, children were learning, and they were being fed, and they had a safe place to sleep. On Sunday, we worshipped with brothers and sisters who were still finding joy in the fact that they could gather together with the rest of the faithful. And we even experienced miracles, as we fed hundreds of children when it seemed like we didn't have enough to feed them all. And we glimpsed heaven as we sat around crowded tables and metal folding chairs, drinking ice-cold bottles of Coke and this wonderful stuff called fruit champagne. We ate some of the best mangoes and some of the best spaghetti one could find, I'm sure, on the whole island of Hispaniola. And it wasn't all overwhelming. It wasn't all third-world discouragement. In fact, most of it was downright heavenly, I'd say. I can remember sitting on the roof of the school one night. That's where you went to get cool. The breeze was cold. Everybody else was either asleep or downstairs, winding down for the night. The power was out. It went out every day right before dark, except for our last night there, because the World Cup was about to come on, so they kept it on for everyone. The air was filled with the sounds of dogs barking, roosters crowing. They forgot they weren't supposed to do that until the sun was out. And there was something going on we all assumed was an all-night church service, or maybe it was an all-night voodoo church service. I don't know. And there'd be an occasional car or a motorcycle that would come growling by. The moon was bright because I remember it was directly overhead and you looked and it looked like the sky was just this concentric circle of fading moonlight. And I had this enormous sense of peace. As if all was right with the world, as if things were as they should be. And I closed my eyes. I even remember I wrote it down in my journal. I said this, I wish I could feel this way all the time. That I could just stay right here in this moment, at peace. And then there was this loud bang. Maybe a car backfired. Probably someone slammed the metal gate that closed off folks from the school. I don't read. It may have been the Holy Spirit. I don't know. But I came to my senses. And I realized at that same time, there were still children living in that school who needed food, who needed an education. There were still families that were living in open sewers, there's still those who were outcast and marginalized who needed to be told that they were loved. I realized all is not peaceful. All is not right with the world. And things are not as they should be. At least not yet. Because every once in a while we've got to come out of our comfort coma. We've got to snap out of our sense of serenity. We've got to come down off the mountain every once in a while so that we can do what we've been called to do. Because I'm convinced that the life of faith to which Jesus calls us is one that is lived down off the mountain. You see, when Jesus took James, John, and Peter up the mountain with him, he took them, Luke tells us in verse 28, to pray. I mean, Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem. Whether they get that or not, Jesus knows. He's on his way ultimately to Calvary, to the cruelest death upon a cross. And on the way, he and his disciples, they're going to encounter a lot of things, adversities, challenges, overwhelming and heartbreaking situations. So, of course, they need some time to pray. They need these respites of prayer, times when they can come together to listen for the heart of God, to ask for courage, for wisdom patience and strength. But while they're praying, Jesus is transfigured. Before The Greek word is he's metamorphed in front of them. The appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. His divinity 
is revealed. But not only is Jesus' divine nature revealed, but he's joined by two other people, the spokespersons for the law and the prophets. Suddenly, the scripture tells us they saw two men, Moses and Elijah. Now, how they knew it was Moses and Elijah, I don't know. Maybe they had big name tags on, I'm Moses. Hello, my name is Elijah. Maybe Elijah was wearing that sort of get up that John the Baptist borrowed. And maybe Moses just waved at him and said, oh, by the way, I'm Moses, in case you were wondering. Maybe they overheard them introducing themselves to Jesus. I don't know. But it was Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking of Jesus's. The word there literally is exodus, connection with Moses, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Here are Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus about his work in Jerusalem, his death, burial, and resurrection. Now we're told that Peter, James, and John are weighed down with sleep. Some of you may be weighed down with sleep right now. But they're fully awake when they realize what happens, when they saw all this transfiguring and appearing going on, because in verse 33, we're told, just as Moses and Elijah were leaving Jesus, Peter says to a master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, three tents, one for you, one for Moses and Elijah. Luke says, I don't know what he's talking about. But Peter and presumably James and John They're they're caught up in what's going on. They're caught up in this glory and in the awe of what they've just witnessed. I mean, think about it. They just saw not just Jesus walking around with dirty feet. This is Jesus, right? The one with the the dazzling clothes, the bright face transfigured before them. And, And who's there? The people they learned about in Sunday school. Moses and Elijah, they're there. Of course they want to stay. They want to stay up on the mountain, set up some tents for Jesus, Moses, Elijah, maybe even have one for them. They didn't say it. They want to have an extended prayer meeting, just the six of them. After all, how can it get better than this? Jesus, Moses, and Elijah together in one place at one time. You couldn't sell enough tickets for that. So I imagine in that moment, in that place, For them, it seemed as if all was right with the world. As if they were in the best place they could ever hope to be. As if it possibly couldn't get any better than it was right then and there. They were caught up in a glorious moment of divine revelation. And then there was a bang. Maybe not a bang. More like a cloud and a voice, really. For while Peter was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. I think it's worth noting that in this moment of devotional desire, this wish for worship, the very voice of God declares to Christ's followers, who Jesus really is. That he is God's son, and he commands them to just stay up here and worship for a while, to adore him, to quote him, maybe to to, uh, set up an easel, paint a picture of him, and, and hang it over their fireplace at home? No. The voice of God commands the followers of Christ to do what? To listen to him. And that's more than just hearing Jesus' words and putting, putting them uh, and saying, well, you know, that, that, that's nice. That's a good idea. Listening is more than hearing. It's about hearing Jesus' words and putting them to action. It's a wake-up call to these three drowsy disciples on the mountain with Jesus, especially in the light of what takes place when they come down from the mountain. They're up there for at least a day because Luke says on the next day when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you, here's my son, my only child. He's got, he's got this spirit that seizes him. And all at once he shrieks out, it convulses him. He foams at the mouth, he mauls himself. He, he, the, the spirit scarcely leaves him alone. And then he says, I begged one of your disciples... 
I beg your disciples to cast it out. But they couldn't. Now I have to wonder, who pointed the first finger? Like here they all are, right? They come down from the mountain all, you know, singing, you know, amazing grace, you know, coming out. They're all thrilled, all pumped up. And here they come down the mountain. And somebody says, I begged your disciples to do it, but they couldn't. What? Oh, he didn't ask me, Jesus. I don't know what he's talking about. He didn't ask me. I'm not sure who he asked, but it wasn't me. Well, you know, some of us figured he might be trying to take advantage of us. We figured maybe his son was just putting on, you know, or maybe maybe he was strung out on something and they were hoping that we would get him sobered up and cleaned. I can hear them now denying the man's claim, saying that he never asked or that they were just being cautious, not wanting to be taken advantage of because folks knew that they were followers of Jesus. We can't be taken advantage of Jesus. I can hear them because I've said things like that myself. Well, you know, you can't be too careful. You know, you help some folks and they're, they're liable to go out and buy drugs and alcohol. You help someone once, pay that power bill once, guess what? They'll be right back next month. Another sob story. They'll have one every time. You know, I don't think they're really even all that bad off. Did you see the phone she was using when she came in here? Put in that, that expensive looking purse she had. I don't think they're that bad off. I, I don't want to be taken advantage of. Sometimes it's hard to come down off the mountain because we're afraid we can't trust anyone. We're afraid we'll be taken advantage of. We're afraid people won't be honest with us. But Jesus, Jesus said one time somewhere, give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Jesus, Jesus said that. And then the voice from the cloud said, this is my son. Listen to him. Of course, the man who they met at the bottom of the mountain, his story is, is a sad one, really. I mean, it is. It's heartbreaking. His only son is possessed by a spirit that causes him to shout out, to shriek, like those who you hear at the other end of the hall at the nursing home, and you go, bless their heart. Shriek, convulse, foams at the mouth. He injures himself with violent seizures and spells of self-mutilation. It's an overwhelming case to be sure, made all the more heartbreaking by the fact he doesn't have another child. This is it, his only one. And he says, I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not, and who can blame them? I mean, really. Perhaps, perhaps when they did, when they tried, all they could do was weep with the man, pray with him, and then say, I'm sorry. There's nothing else I can do. Maybe they tried to cast out the demon, tried to heal the boy, but the situation was so dire, so pitiful, that their emotions got the best of them, and they came to the realization that his only hope, the only hope we've got for you, man, is a miracle, and I'm not a miracle worker. You need Jesus, they said. Maybe. I've been there before. Standing by the hospital bed, the sound of the ventilator and the beeping of monitors, like the ticking hands on life's clock. I've been there as loved ones beg for a change in condition. Just let the O2 level go up just a little bit more. Let his heart rate pick up a little bit more. A glimmer of hope as their son, their sister, their father, that they will, they will come out of this. And in the weight of that grief, as a stranger in the room, all I can say, all I can muster to say is, I, I'll pray for you. It's not a bad thing. It's a comfort to know someone's praying for you. But when you're at the end of your rope, when there's no other option seemingly left, and you're looking for a miracle, it's hard. But you know, Jesus said one time somewhere else, Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these. Jesus said that. Jesus said that. And the voice says, this is my son. Listen 
to him. Life down off the mountain is hard. It's hard because it's real. It's full of complications, contradictions, adversities, overwhelming and heartbreaking situations. But the life of faith is a life lived down from the mountain in all of that dirty realness. Yes, there are times we need to meet up on the mountain. Times like this when we need to gather for worship, for prayer, for encouragement and guidance. And those times, those times are a vital part of the life of a Christ follower. But if all we do is hunker down where we're comfortable, where we're safe, where all seems right with the world, where at least we're at peace, well then, my friends, we are not listening to what Jesus said. And I'm afraid that we're not listening. For Christ came down from the mountain, and Christ calls us to follow him down from the mountain, out the door of the sanctuary and into the world. Not to condemn it, he says but to save it, to share the good news of a loving God in Christ Jesus, to give food to those who are hungry, drink to those who are thirsty, clothes to those who are naked, comfort to those who are afflicted, justice to the oppressed, to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, we can't do that if we just build tabernacles and stay up on the mountain. So if Christ's transfiguration teaches us anything, I think it's this. Yes, Christ is fully God. And in that confession, we must also confess that God has come down to us to show us the way of true love, to show us the way of God's kingdom. Because, you know, Jesus said something else one time, many times, somewhere. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these, he said, the two command, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus said that. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. This is it. Everything else hangs on that. Jesus said that. And the voice of God speaks to us today. This is my son. Listen to him. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O Lord, when we would rather stay up on the mountain. Have mercy on us, Lord, when we say we hear you, but we don't listen. Give us now, Lord, ears to hear, and even more, Lord, hearts that listen, hands and feet that are willing and able and ready to come down off the mountain to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, strengthen us, stir in our presence and move in our hearts that we may listen to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Invitation hymn this morning is 428. I need the every hour. Let's stand as we sing.
As we go down from the mountain and out the doors of this place, as you go into the world, may you have ears to listen to Jesus. May you do what he's called you to do. Let us pray together. Lord, go with us from this place with ears for listening, hearts for loving, hands and feet for doing. And may we, Lord, follow you as you bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen.